Welcome to module one, topic two, which is an introduction to audit. Now today we're going to look at the regulation around the profession, how the profession is actually structured in terms of firms. We're going to look at the legal liability that auditors are exposed to and also the process to accept clients and then continue working with clients on a regular basis. Audit regulation is really important. It's to help us ensure that there's a minimum quality around audits and expectations all around of the auditor from the general public and users of the financial statements are really clear so that there's no misconceptions about what an auditors should or should not be doing. So what do we already know about audits? Well, we already know that auditors have to follow the auditing standards and follow an ethical code and maintain their independence. These are already components that we've talked about in previous modules and topics. But there are new things that we're going to talk about today. The first one is that auditors have to be inspected by ASIC. And this is to ensure that auditors are following the rules and regulations under the Corporations Act and that everybody is providing quality audits. It's about meeting that base level of standard. Now, you can actually go into the audit uh, inspection reports, ASIC inspects and then publishes reports based on the audits that they've conducted or the checks that they've conducted. And there's been a call by the parliamentary inquiry into financial reporting and audit to actually have more information provided in the reports that ASIC produces. Right now, information has been relatively anonymized. Um, we did see this year uh, in 2019, 2020, that there's been some more detail about how many deficiencies in uh, different firms or what proportion of their audits are not meeting the required standards, but we're expecting much more. Audit firms also have the opportunity to self-publish the outcomes of their ASIC inspection reports of, I think, which PwC, EY, and I believe KPMG all reported, but Deloitte actually refused to. I did mention a parliamentary inquiry. There is now an interim report for that parliamentary inquiry. And if you're interested in that, there'll be another video in the additional learning materials um, that is optional to watch if you're interested. So what we know also is that ASIC is moving to prosecute auditors for breaches. In ASIC's latest report, they did announce that they're going to move to a strategy that is more focused on prosecuting audit firms for breaches. And there's got to be a really good reason why they choose not to. Right now, no firms really have been charged unless there's been a major corporate collapse. And we'll talk about that in some of the other topics. But right now, they're not choosing to prosecute. That's definitely going to change moving forward because ASIC has taken this approach of prosecute unless there is a reason not to. So it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out over the next 12 to 18 months and whether that really does change auditor behavior. Uh, we know that about 25 to 30% of audits are deficient. They're not meeting the basic standards of the ASAs. It will be interesting to see the next set of inspection reports to see if this threat of prosecution will actually help improve audit quality. So let's look at the structure of the profession. If you've never worked in a public accounting practice before, then understanding how a firm is structured, what the industry is like, is really important so that you can get some context of what we're going to be talking about in this course. Later on, we might ask you to assume the position of an audit senior or an audit manager to imagine what different people might do. So this information is to help you try and get a picture of what the audit firms are like. So let's look big picture first at the helicopter view. So we know that this is all the players in the game. You've got the big four and the big four are are four big firms, PwC, which is one of the ones I used to work for, EY, KPMG, and Deloitte. Um, the big four started out as the big eight, went down to the big six, then down to the big five, mostly due to mergers um, within the top players. Uh, we did see one player drop out, that was Arthur Anderson, after the WorldCom and Enron scandals back in 2001, I think it was. So you've got the big four players, and the big four players, they provide a whole range of different services. They provide audits, they provide tax, they provide consulting. Now, besides the big four, you also have 
a large number of second tier firms. These are still firms that are global. So the big four are global. Our second tier network is also quite international. So that's organizations like Grant Thornton. It's organizations like BDO. Um, there's a number of different second tier um, audit firms. Uh, there's probably maybe 10 of those in total in that second tier. They still work on a model of offering audits, tax, and consulting. Then you've got a lot of small to medium sized firms, and there are a whole range of different sizes. So you've got, for example, Walker Wayland, which is a medium sized audit practice, right down to really small practices that might only have something like one or two partners, and then a whole range of staff underneath them. So there are thousands of firms within this ecosystem. It's not just the big four and the second tier because lots of different sizes of firms need audits for different reasons. If you're a publicly listed firm, then you need an audit because the Corporations Act and the Australian Stock Exchange says that you have to have one. But if you're a smaller company, you might be going for an audit to get a better deal on a bank loan. You might be having to have an audit if you're a charity, if you receive government grant money, so public money. There's lots of different reasons why firms need audits. Now over here, you'll see ASIC, and you'll see the little uh, eye with the um, magnifying glass there. And ASIC is really the one that oversees the market. They're our corporate regulator, um, and they're overseeing all of the big four firms. They also oversee corporations, but they're overseeing audit firms. Now over here in orange, you've got the accounting professional bodies. And we've got chartered accountants, which you might sometimes see written down as CAANZ, CPA Australia, IPA, and also the ACCA. Now the biggest players in the country are Chartered Accountants and CPA Australia. They probably, um, that's where most people who are public accountants sit, but we are seeing growth in areas like ACCA, which is not a qualification that we um, talk about really a lot at university, but I can give you some more information if you're interested. Now the professional bodies, all of these accounting firms are members of the professional bodies. So every partner has to have a certificate that it's going to allow them to practice in public um, and ASIC has to register them. ASIC will also register auditors. Oh, that's not very helpful there in that black color. There's also a register of company auditors. Um, sometimes that's the partner, sometimes that's also lower level staff that become registered company auditors. Those are the people who can actually sign an audit opinion. So Chartered Accountants advocates for members. Um, they also inspect the work of members as well as ASIC. ASIC inspects all of the big four every single year and a sample, not a random sample, but a specific sample of smaller tier firms. Chartered Accountants also does inspections of smaller firms. It doesn't tend to do inspections of bigger firms because that's now being done by ASIC. But this is the overarching environment and the main players within the audit game. So what does it look like inside the firms? Well, I mentioned earlier that inside the firms, your partner is going to be ASIC registered because their role is to sign off on the opinion. We have our audit opinion and our audit report and they have to sign their name. They're legally responsible. But you'll notice that firms are shaped like pyramids. We start with our graduates or our cadets or our trainees or our interns. We're seeing um, cadets and trainees are typically straight out of high school. They go to work at a firm while they're studying part-time. Graduate auditors, just like the name suggests, is after graduation. Senior auditors typically get to that particular role once they've completed their CA or their CPA qualification. Now the CA qualification is more common within the audit world. Um, CPAs, we see lots of CPAs everywhere and CPAs do exist in the audit profession, but the majority are CAs. Now, 
how this works is also that the senior auditor is responsible for checking the work of a junior auditor. So maybe that's the graduate or the trainee or the intern. You'll have seniors on top of seniors, one level up, you'll have managers. Now some firms will also have an assistant manager level sort of in between there, but managers usually will handle the day-to-day -day running of an audit, scheduling what people are doing, um, and the managers also check the work of the senior auditors. So you'll notice that there's many layers of checks and balances. So managers are responsible for running things day to day. Um, more experienced managers might be called senior managers. Then you have directors and at the very top is the partner. So the partner is the ultimate responsibility. Um, and this pyramid is a really good example of how numbers also work within these firms. So there's a lot more graduates and trainees than there are partners. On a team, there might be a partner. There may also be a director. Uh, so directors are essentially partners in development. All right, so if you think, oh yeah, you know, I'm a senior manager, I think I wanna become a partner, then director is the next step where you start to learn all the things that partners need to do. There's quite a lot of responsibilities in being a partner. Now a firm will have many partners. Um, there are different types of partners, so partners and most firms will have equity partners. So you have to buy in and you become an equity partner in the firm. But some companies also offer non-equity partners. So non-equity partnerships just receive salary, whereas your equity partners will receive base salary plus some sort of proportion of their profits. And that's driven by the clients that they have, the fees that they have. Everybody else down here in the senior manager, manager, senior auditor, director role, most of those people are on a salary with potentially some sort of bonus, depending on the profitability of the firm and the group for the financial year. So most of the time in this subject, we'll typically ask you to be a senior auditor if we're asking you to check something, or we'll ask you to be a graduate. So we're treating you like you've don't really know what to do, we're giving you lots of instructions, but later on we might ask you to be the senior. But what is really important, no matter what role you're in, is that teams work together and teamwork and communication skills is really important. You might be auditing sales and someone else might be auditing accounts receivable. We know these accounts go together because we know it's debit accounts receivable credit sales. So if those people aren't talking to each other, you might find an error in sales that also might flow through to accounts receivable or to cash. So working together as a team is really important. Making sure you have some process so that everybody knows what everybody else is doing, that the work gets reviewed. And that reviewing is really important as well because we need to make sure that our audits meet our ASAs our auditing standards. And the process of review is actually mandated within ASA, I wanna say 220, about quality control, which is making sure that all work is checked so that we don't make any mistakes. Now we're gonna move into legal liability. And legal liability is really, really important because when I give my audit report, I give a whole lot of information and then I sign. And that report goes off to the shareholders and they rely on that piece of information. There is reliance for the shareholders to make decisions. So if we give information that is incorrect, incomplete, then these decisions over here might not be the best decisions that were made, they might be suboptimal. So there is the potential for legal liability associated with giving an audit opinion. An example of one here is a case with PwC where there was a $2.1 billion mistake in the classification of debt. It should have been classified as current Instead, it was non-current. Um, and the partner who made this mistake 
ended up being unable to practice audits for a number of years. They were banned from being an audit partner, which if you're a partner means that you can't earn any income. Um, there are certainly big effects in terms of reputation um, if you get sued. Okay, just like if you made a product, it ended up being faulty, it spread like wildfire on social media, the reputation of an audit firm is one of its biggest assets. So protecting that reputation by doing audits correctly is really, really important. But today, the focus in this video is about understanding the whole legal structure that exists around audits so that we can try and minimize any breaches that might result in legal liability and lawsuits because nobody wants to get sued. There are three ways in which auditors are exposed to legal liability. The first one is contract law. All right, when you have a client, you sign a contract. And remember the terms of that contract will set out everybody's responsibilities. Who does what, when do they pay, everything. So the terms of the contract set out what each party is supposed to do. So contract law is the first part where we could be exposed to liability if we don't do what we're set out to do. The second area is the tort of negligence. All right, now remember a tort is not based on a government regulation, it's based on legal cases and precedents. And precedents are essentially where judges make decisions about court cases and those judgments form the rules by which everybody else needs to follow. But of course, as we move through time, society's expectations change, um, the judges and the government's expectations change. And so sometimes our rulings about certain behavior or what auditors are supposed to do, do evolve over time. So the tort of negligence is always evolving with new cases. So if the auditor is negligent in their role, then there's a possibility that they may be sued. And then the last one is regulation and legislation. And that regulation and legislation comes from a couple of different areas. One of those is the Corporations Act, but the other one is uh, consumer protection because essentially users of the financial statements are consumers of our product. So now we're gonna dig into each of these in a little bit more detail. Overall, the auditor has a duty of care. They have a duty to exercise a reasonable skill and care expected of a professional. So what do we mean by reasonable? Um, anything that the average auditor would expect of that particular product or service. That does include making sure that we adhere to regulatory and professional standards. So for us, the Corporations Act and the Consumer Competition Act and professional standards, including our ASAs and our APESs. So Caparo said, the professional man, and essentially it's not really man, it's professional person for being uh, politically correct here, owes a duty to exercise a standard of skill and care appropriate to his professional status. So appropriate for a professional auditor. So what does it mean if we're negligent? Well, negligence does have a specific meaning in the law. A careless or unintentional in nature entails a breach of a contractual duty or a duty of care in a tort owed to another person. So the key words there Careless, unintentional in nature, breach of a duty. Okay, so if you go out for a really late night, you come back to work hungover, and you do a poor job of making your professional audit judgments, then you've been careless. All right. Now, notice here it doesn't say intentional. If you're intentionally doing the wrong thing, then you've potentially engaged in fraud and in some instances, a criminal act, which would not fall under the tort of negligence, it would fall under a different jurisdiction. So in the context of audit, we would have been negligent if we made a judgment or error that what a normal reasonable auditor would not have made in the same situation. How do we tell if that's the case? Well, if there was a lawsuit, 
we would actually ask a number of experienced auditors to come in, look at the evidence that's been presented, that the auditor who did the wrong thing or who was negligent used to make their decision and say, in this situation, what would your decision be? And if they match up, then that auditor has done a reasonable job. If they don't, and the uh, test auditors or the sample of auditors said we would have done X, and the actual auditor under investigation did Y, then it's very likely that they have been negligent. This is why reviewing of work and learning on the job is so important. We can only teach you so much at university about audit. The real skill comes in making judgments every single day and making mistakes. Everybody is going to make mistakes, but the key is can you learn from those mistakes? Can you do things differently once you've made a mistake, learn from it, and then gone on with more advanced and more complete knowledge. This is really, really important. And so if you are going to an internship or a vacation job or a grad job, the question you should always ask is, why am I doing this? Why is this important? How does this fit into the entire audit process so that you don't get caught out? Now, I mentioned before that our duty of care to people in a contract, our management of our client, is really, really easy because in contract law, we know that we have the audit firm and we have the client and we have our contract and we can sue based on those details. But remember, the client is essentially management. What about shareholders? All right. What about other people that might use the report like banks or other forms of lenders? Well, if you're one of these people, you're a shareholder or you're a bank, then you're classified under the requirements as a third party, all right? So these are the parties to the transaction and third parties are really people who are using the information but they're on the outside looking in. They're not privy or part of the contract. So this is where the tort of negligence really comes in because there's been a number of cases that have considered the auditor's liability to persons other than the immediate client and that immediate client is management and the board of directors, all right? It's not shareholders, even though they're the people who ultimately use our audit report. Now, there's been a lot of cases in this area because this is the hardest bit. Who are we liable to? Is it shareholders? Is it lenders? Is it customers who look at the financial statements? Is it suppliers who look at the financial statements? There's the potential here for a lot of people to sue us. And so the court makes judgments on who can sue the auditor as a third party so that we have some certainty because the more people that can sue us, the greater the level of risk. Now that term, for a case to be successful, the plaintiff, the third party, must establish and prove a reasonable degree of proximity. And this word proximity is the key critical term here. It says, you need, and we think about proximity like there's my camera to me, that's proximity. So proximity sometimes means distance, but it doesn't mean physical distance, it means legal distance. So we start with Donahue and Stevenson. So. Can you remember what Donahue and Stevenson was about? If you covered this in your basic uh, marketing or maybe consumer law, Donahue and Stevenson was the snail in the ginger beer bottle. You can actually go to the place where the snail in the ginger beer bottle happened and there's a little plaque and some information there. But the woman bought the ginger beer, drank it, shouldn't have been a snail inside and the court agreed that the manufacturer of the ginger beer owes its intended users a duty of care. Now, that's gone on to be used in as precedent in lots of other areas, car manufacturing, but it also applies to auditing. Now in audit, London and General Bank, the case I mentioned earlier, was our equivalent really of Donahue and Stevenson. But some other cases that have come up include uh, the Candler and Headley Byrne case, which says, a duty of care is owed to any third party to whom the auditor shows accounts or to whom the auditor knows the client is going to show the accounts, all right? So if you know that your client, so if the client says, okay, I'm coming in and I'm getting an audit because I want to get a bank loan, and you tell the auditor, 
the auditor knows from the client that they're going to get a bank loan. Then under Candler and Headley Byrne, then technically the bank is also one of the people that we owe a duty of care to because we know in advance that they are going to be the users. So if there's specific information that is told to you about the purpose of why you have an audit, then you are exposed to that particular third party. Now the question for us becomes, what about general purpose financial reports? All right, like the annual report. The annual report isn't really designed to go to a bank. The annual report is designed to inform shareholders. So under this particular situation, if a bank also used the financial information, they're not really the intended users because the intended users of an annual report are the shareholders. So the next test that came up uh, from Scott Group in 1978 was reasonable foreseeability. So they took the idea of um, you know, who was intended as the user and they said a duty is owed to a specific third party whom the auditor was not aware uh, but they should have been aware that they could rely on it. Now this is a, a little bit dis different because if your client said okay I'm going to ANZ Bank then okay ANZ Bank that's fine but if they say oh I'm going to A Bank and they don't tell you then we might not be aware of that or if it's a general audit report we're not aware, but we should have been. If we knew the company was in financial distress, we knew they needed a bank loan, then the Scott Group said, oh, well, it was reasonably foreseeable. You should have known they needed to go to a bank. And that becomes really tricky because as auditors, we are not fortune tellers. We cannot see into the future, but we can look at the information that we have now. So reasonable foreseeability is sort of one part of it. That was the next step. But let's look at what happened next. What happened next is where we currently are, which is this idea of proximity. And we mentioned proximity. Um, the auditor must encourage, entice, or induce the third party to rely on the financial report. Now with shareholders in an annual report, we definitely encourage, entice, and induce. We say, dear shareholders, this report is for the shareholders. So we are clearly identifying the party that is going to be using the financial uh, statements and our audit report. We do not say, dear shareholders, and maybe also any banks who may be looking at you know, loaning money to this company. So proximity really tightened up um, the idea of proximity, and this came out in the Asanda case in 1997, um, and this is the time progression, all right? So this is time happening here, and this is current precedent. Prior to that, we'd had a really wide definition, but in 1997, that narrowed it right down. And that meant for auditors, only shareholders really can sue us unless somebody pays for a specific audit report um, for a specific purpose. So really, we don't owe finance companies, banks, other lenders any duty of care unless we encourage, entice, or induce them to do so. So a bit more on the Asanda case. Um, we mentioned that they have to prepare the financial information on the basis it's going to that third party, which we as auditors know it's typically shareholders. It has to be relied upon and they ran the risk of suffering a loss. Now, if you want more information on proximity, there's another video where I actually show it using puppets and different people about proximity in a lot more detail. So if you're a bank, you're a lender, and you're looking at the financial information of a company and you're trying to decide like, and you think I wanna get some assurance, well then you can actually request something called a privity letter. And a privity letter is essentially a letter that creates proximity between an unknown third party and the auditor. And the letter essentially says, hey PwC or KPMG, I'm going to rely on the audit report for ABC Limited. Will you sign this letter um, in acknowledgement that I am going to rely on the financial reports and that you owe me, the external third party, a duty of care? Now if you're an audit firm, would you even think about signing one of these letters? No, you definitely wouldn't because as soon as you sign one, you create another third party 
that you're going to be exposed to in terms of le legal liability. So you're going to increase your legal liability. You're going to increase the chance you're being sued. When I worked at Coopers and Libran, which is now the predecessor to PwC, and I was studying this at uni, I thought, hey, this is a really interesting question. And I went back to, we had this database, and it had all the templates of letters of how to write to clients and what an engagement letter or a contract looked like and what do we do if the client requests this. And I tried to find a sample response to a privity letter because I looked at AGS 1014, and this is no longer in circulation, but this is back then, you know, over 20 years ago. Um, I said, look, why is there no sample letter to respond to a privity letter? And the audit guidance statement says that what we should do, if we get a request for a privity letter, um, we should respond unequivocally that the shareholder is the only group entitled to rely on the financial report. And I thought, great. If we get one, we're supposed to write back and say, no, 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 this is only for shareholders. And when I went to the Coopers and Librand database, I could not find a response to a privity letter. And I thought, oh, this is a bit strange. So I went to, uh, I wrote an email to the legal team and I said, look, there is no response to a privity letter. What should we do? And they said, oh yeah, we don't put a, a standard template letter in there because we don't want anyone to respond. We don't, you know, you might as well just take the letter and throw it in the bin. I know that financial lenders may request privity letters from the auditors of clients, but I can tell you, I'm pretty sure that no audit firm is ever going to even say that they even receive the letter. They're probably just going straight in the bin. But the audit guidance statement back from 20 years ago did say you should say, no, 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 this is only for shareholders. Um, if your firm does do that, um, I'd love to hear about it because I'm always looking for more information on this area. So how do you try and minimize legal liability? And really, this is the responsibility of the partnership because it's the partners who are gonna get sued if something goes wrong. If you're a junior, you make a mistake, you're not gonna to have to pay the millions of dollars, the partners will. So what are the things that you can do? Deal only with clients possessing integrity. I probably wouldn't wanna audit any company owned by Donald Trump. The guy is known to be a liar. Um, and so if you audit clients who have had integrity issues, issues with misleading the public, not being truthful, then they're likely to try and do that to you. You don't wanna be involved in that sort of drama. The next one, employ qualified personnel who've done the right sort of university subjects and supervise them properly. And this comes also out of ASA 220, about audit quality and supervision, that's really important. And the next one, follow the auditing standards. That's what we're gonna teach you about in the subject. Maintain independence. We have to do that under APES 110 and the Corporations Act. So it's a legal requirement. We're gonna learn about the next one a lot more. Understand the client's business. This is gonna be really critical in audit. Perform quality audits which also links back to following the accounting standards and supervising employees, documenting all of your work. Documenting all of your work. When things are said and done, if you have to go to court, your documentation is what's gonna save your bacon. And ASA 230 on documentation has lots of rules and requirements, and we're gonna learn about these throughout the term. The next one is have an engagement letter and a representation letter. Don't worry about the representation letter now. The engagement letter, that's our contract. We need that to be ironclad. The next one you might not have heard of, carry insurance. So audit partners all have insurance, just like doctors have insurance in case they get sued. No partner has you know, $100 million or $5 million sort of sitting away there in the bank in case they get sued. So they pay insurance premiums. Um, in New South Wales, you can only sue the auditor up to a maximum amount. So there's there's a ceiling and it's based on a multiplier of the audit fee. Um, in the US, no such ceiling exists. So there's quite a lot of protection there. And if something starts to go wrong, see your firm's legal counsel. They're always gonna be the first people to talk to. Now I mentioned before that we have regulation um, besides the Corporations Act, and that is the Consumer Competition Act which in the old, old, old days was called the Trade Practices Act. So the Consumer Competition Act plus the state-based Fair Trading Acts 
prohibit misleading and deceptive conduct. And if you give an incorrect audit opinion, then there is the possibility that you've been misleading and deceptive. Now, of course, misleading does ask the question of, is it intentional? I'm not a law expert, so I'm not quite up to date as to whether if you're intentionally misleading, then you definitely fall under this area. But if you made a mistake, um, if you did something, everything reasonable and it still ended up being wrong, then I don't think you'd fall under this misleading and deceptive um, area. If you are being misleading and deceptive, then charges or the lawsuit would come from the ACCC. Um, people have tried to sue auditors under the Consumer Competi uh, Con Competition and Consumer Act, I always get the name wrong, um, the CCA, but nobody I know has been successful to this point in suing an audit firm in this way. Now, of course, if you are intentionally covering up something, you're intentionally aiding the client in doing the wrong thing, then essentially you're conducting fraud. And fraud is inappropriate under the Crimes Act of 1914 and ASIC and the police might sue you. And potentially there's room in there to send auditors to jail if they've been intentionally assisting the client in covering up fraud. It's definitely something auditors don't wanna do. Um, I mentioned earlier that there is a cap on legal liability. Um, most firms, they're not actual partnerships, so there's not that joint and several liability. They have proportional liability um, amongst the partners if there is contributory negligence in play. What happens if you do do the wrong thing? Well, obviously ASIC through the company's auditors uh, Liquidators Disciplinary Board will uh, take action there. If you're failing to meet the ASAs, ASIC is still, is now going to start pursuing a lot more action. So the professional bodies can do things like exclude you from uh, being a member. Uh, they could suspend you for a particular period of time. Uh, you might be fined. You might have to pay any legal costs and imprisonment, uh, but that's not something that the CPAs can do. That's something that the government all right, so CA and CPA can't put auditors in jail, but if you do breach the Crimes Act, then the government will attempt to put you there. So what are the key takeaways from legal liability? The first one is that auditors are exposed to multiple sources of legal liability, and we need to make sure that we understand the concept of proximity and also what are the steps in a legal case. The best way to prevent from getting sued is to conduct high quality audits. That means that you're going to need to make sure that you have proper audit procedures, that we have supervision of staff and that we're all following the auditing standards. Oh, and understand the concept of proximity, which I already talked about up there. So that's it for legal liability. If you're ready to move on, of course, just scroll down to the next video and click play.